behold for your consideration sapphire 7900 gre individual review edition i did the roundup review already but i've got three different 7900 gre's that i want to cover separately because they have different features i mean for one the most obvious one is sapphire's got two hdmi and two display port yeah pretty big difference let's have a chat <laughs> First off, let's get one thing out of the way. The 7900 GRE is at a really interesting spot in the lineup in AMD's GPUs overall. And this GPU performed in line within margin of error of, of our other 7900 GREs. However, this one has an overclock. And if we push the overclock just a little bit, this one actually overclocks better than any other GPU that I have. More overclocks, uh, more overclocks, but you can't really say this, GPU is gonna overclock better for you. This version of the GPU is overclockable, but it doesn't mean that your overclock is gonna be as good as mine. Also, another curious thing about this GPU is that it had the hottest hotspot temperature of the three GPUs that I tried, but we could easily rectify that by ramping the fan speed in AMD's adrenaline control software. So not really a big deal there. With the GPU in performance mode, basically meaning we're running our fans as hot as we can, but also with the overclock, it did a pretty good job keeping everything below 95 degrees C, even for our hotspot, which is pretty nice. If you are gonna do the extreme overclocking thing, there is an extra four pin fan header here. This can make a big difference, like connect one of your case fans to this, maybe one of the ones at the rear IO, so that it's pulling more warm air from out around your GPU. It's a nice feature. The other four pin connector here is for RGB, so you can have RGB controlled by your GPU which is cool, I guess. The other thing this GPU has, if you are into overclocking, is a BIOS switch. Uh, if you're into Linux VFIO, the BIOS switch can also be really handy because sometimes you want to run a custom vBIOS and Sapphire specifically for Linux has some really great things that they usually do with their vBIOS that makes vGPU pass through a little easier. We've covered this some in the past, but it bears repeating. Sapphire, for whatever they do to their cards, a lot of the time, not always, not universally, but a lot of the time, the vBIOS on Sapphire cards is more likely to work in VFIO type scenarios. I'm not sure why that is. I know that historically, uh, Sapphire would qualify their GPUs for use on Macs, but with Macs moving to the M1, M2, M3, I think that's less of a thing than it used to be. But for external GPU enclosures, even on the Intel iMacs, for example, Sapphire would put a lot of work into making sure that their GPUs would work in a Thunderbolt enclosure. So maybe a holdover from that because Intel and UEFI and vBIOS stuff is really picky on Macs and Thunderbolt. And so that was something you could always count on Sapphire to do. Another nice hardware feature of Sapphire is that their fans are pretty easily replaceable. They're modular. So you can just pop out a couple of screws and replace the fan. And that is a feature that's featured on Sapphire's website. You can take a look at that and, and see about that. And that's pretty awesome. The repairability thing. Generally, you shouldn't have to repaste or redo the thermal stuff on your on your GPU, but that the hotspot temperature was initially worrying me in my in my review. This is a three slot card. And it takes two eight pin power connectors, and there's really not a, a lot else that sets it apart. It has five heat pipes that run the length of the card, and the heat sink is divided into two segments: one over the actual GPU, and another segment over the rear half of the card with a small flow through area. In terms of physical properties and physical characteristics, the Sapphire Nitro Plus OC Edition is 320 millimeters long. It's also a tall card at 122 millimeters. That might be a problem for some small form factor machines. And as I said, it's a three slot card, but it is a true sl three slot card, meaning that it isn't <laughs> three slots and a little bit. It actually gives you a little bit of breathing room if you only have exactly three slots of clearance because it's only 61.57 millimeters thick. This card does support a maximum of four displays, two HDMI and two DisplayPort. If you're going to use this on Linux, by the way, the HDMI ports are not fully functional because of shenanigans from the HDMI consortium. This is not an AMD problem or a Sapphire problem. This is strictly the HDMI standards body not wanting to embrace open source. Sorry, guys, at the HDM HDMI uh, consortium. Uh, it's 2024. The entire internet runs on open source. Get with the program. Intel has this problem too, and Intel's solution to this problem is interesting. Their GPUs for the HDMI out use a dedicated physical hardware converter chip 
So the graphics PHY is four DisplayPort connections. But for Intel on their GPUs, they add an extra component to the bomb, the build materials, an extra component that's not, strictly speaking, necessary to convert in hardware DisplayPort to HDMI signals. This isn't as clean as natively supporting HDMI with uh, your actual GPU, like all a path from the HDMI connector all the way back to the graphics processing silicon on the card. There's a lot of reasons for that, but the one of the most important is HDMI. FreeSync, as it is implemented with DisplayPort, and as it is implemented with HDMI, is different. And it is not really straightforward to translate HDMI as it exists with a FreeSync signal into something that would be compatible with a DisplayPort monitor that also does FreeSync. See also the lack of converters in the market that properly do DisplayPort to HDMI conversion that also include FreeSync and HDR and audio and a long laundry list of things. But still, Intel's solution, knowing that a lot of people buying Intel GPUs are really interested in Linux support, pretty cool. Maybe Sapphire could do something like that with one or both of their HDMI implementations because these are really popular cards uh, for Linux users because of the features and everything else that they have. But again, this is not really, like I don't blame Sapphire for not doing that. It's, it's, it's purely just the HDMI consortium having no idea that open source is a thing because they're living in 1960. And uh, see also all the stuff that Cory Doctorow says about uh, extracting rents and all the sort of worst aspects of capitalism. HDMI consortium. But again, not Sapphire's fault. This GPU has 16 gigs of VRAM, which is awesome. It's as much VRAM as the 7800 XT, but this card is surprisingly faster, 80 compute units. And with, with the overclocked Nitro Plus, I was able to get even beyond the advertised boost clock to 2.5 gigahertz, where it basically settled in and ran that way all the time. As long as I was willing to live with a little bit more fan noise, a little bit more power target uh, power, but it was stable across pretty much every game that I tested. I didn't find any games that were unstable, but there was a couple of weird things that Starfield did, but that might just be Starfield. I don't know. So I've been using this GPU for a while. I like it. It works well. In doing a bunch of random stuff with this GPU, I also found that the dual BIOS switch has three positions. Yes, three positions for dual BIOS. One is software selection. So you can pick between an A and a B BIOS with a software utility. And then the other one is position one and position two. Uh, Sapphire also has a unique thing in their software stack called Trix Boost. This is kind of like what FSR does, where it'll render the game at a lower resolution and then upscale it at the last possible second. The difference is the Trix Boost offers a lot more granularity and control over what you do. This can make a bigger difference at 1080p, believe it or not, because I think FSR is not as good as DLSS at the 1080p resolution, but when we're talking 1440 and 4K, yeah, it works great. And this card for 4K, if you're willing to deal with FSR2 and FSR3, works really well in that kind of a usage scenario, so. If you have a Sapphire card and you've never messed around with Trix Boost, you should give it a try. It's interesting, it's an interesting technology. This card also shuts down fans when they're not needed, and so they added a new option to the software called Trix Fan Check. So it'll turn the fans on to make sure your fans actually work. That's cool, I guess. I have a feeling that's more to do with people calling support and saying, my fans aren't working. And it's like, yeah, it's because your GPU's not hot. That's normal. All right, let's take a look at the overall benchmark scores. 3D Mark. Now for the artificial benchmarks, it tells an interesting story, but it's a story that doesn't line up with reality. This card is faster than a 4080. Yeah, it's an artificial benchmark, at least Fire Strike. Okay, Time Spy, it's a little slower than a 4080, but this shows a pretty good delineation between the 7800 XT, the 7900 GRE, and the 7900 XT, which has four more gigs of VRAM. If we start with Assassin's Creed Mirage, no DLSS, no upscaling technology, just to see how things land. Well, the 7900 GRE is looking pretty good here, especially when you consider the MSRP of this card. At 1440p, this thing is performing really well. The performance fall off to 4K is more than I would expect. We may be limited by VRAM here with only 16 gigs. Even the 4070 with its 12 gigs is, is suffering a fair bit here. And you can see at 1440p, the, the 12 gigs of VRAM in Assassin's Creed really hobbles the 4070. I mean, if the 4070 had more VRAM, it would no doubt perform better here. But 7900 GRE takes the lead mainly because of its 16 gigs of VRAM, I think. And then at 1080p, 161 FPS, that's pretty good. What do you want? Baldur's Gate was also very, very playable, even at 4K, which is nice, even in city scenes. 
So the way we test Baldur's Gate is we go through the city center where there's tons of people and characters and everything else. When you're out in the forest or you're in Act 1, basically anything is going to run like Grease Lightning. When you get to Act 3, things change. And that's just the game. But as you can see, the performance breakdown here, the 7900 GRE delivers an excellent value. And the Sapphire implementation of the 7900 GRE is no different. Cyberpunk is another fun one and one of the ones that I try to use to evaluate ray tracing performance. Cyberpunk is not a game that I would play at 4K, at least native. With upscaling technology, yes, the 7900 GRE with FSR3 and some other stuff, it can be playable at 4K, but you're going to need an upscaling technology, in my opinion. 1440p, however, pretty playable. You can get it to about 90 FPS with a little tuning. Pretty pretty locked in and solid at 90 FPS, but, but the in-game benchmark shows 104 FPS. And again, this is where benchmarking, even in the game, and real-world performance eh, can deviate just a little bit. Now, for 1080p ray tracing, ray tracing ultra, <laughs> even at 1080p, uh, the performance really tanks. You're going to need some kind of an upscaling technology if you plan to use ray tracing. And FSR3 is just not quite as good as DLSS at 1080p. At 1440p and 4K, FSR is a much better technology, but at 1080p, it struggles a little bit more than DLSS does. If 80 to 90 frames per second is uh, below where you would like to be playing at 4K on a 7900 GRE, you can really boost the frame rate by turning down some of the graphical fidelity settings and also using FSR. Or break out the Trix Boost. This is a great example of where Trix Boost might be really handy because you don't necessarily like it's 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 not a precision instrument going from quality to balanced. Whereas with Trix Boost, you could reduce your resolution, say, 5 percent, and that would probably bump you over 100 FPS of 4K. So it's a much more minute loss in visual quality. Uh, than you get out of the box with AMD's drivers. And this is something unique to Sapphire. I always like to include Shadow of the Tomb Raider, even though it's basically an ancient title because the performance over time really doesn't change all that much. Driver improvements, sure, driver improvements can improve things. And it also has a little bit of ray tracing, but it's really just the shadow ray tracing. So the performance, eh, okay, it makes sense. Very, very playable, even at 4K, 1440p and 1080p, of course, a pretty good performance. Heck, even Shadow of the Tomb Raider posts pretty good ray tracing performance because it's an older title and it's... Uh, uh, Ray tracing capabilities are, let's say, modest because it is an older title. Now, what about the AI stuff? Well, can you do some interesting AI stuff with this? Isn't NVIDIA ahead there? Uh, NVIDIA with CUDA, it is a little bit easier to translate from CUDA on the desktop to uh, CUDA in the enterprise or with CUDA high, you know, workstation class GPUs. But AMD is catching up fast. Check out this Rockham blog post. There's a new blog from AMD. And the new Rock and Blog talks about the software updates and everything like that. You don't have to be running Linux. Although, if you are running Linux, you're going to have a more first-class experience with this GPU when it comes to AI and machine learning. But here's a blog post from AMD that details getting up and running with stable diffusion and large language models on this GPU. 16 gigs of VRAM is... More is always nice when we're talking about AI, but 16 gigs will get you started if you just want to do some experimentation and mess around with stuff. And remember the 7600 16 gigabyte version. Pretty sure some people have in mind to use that with large language models as well. Maybe some higher education experimentation or something like that. I don't know. But 16 gigs of VRAM is enough to start experimenting with AI. You're not going to be doing any complicated training, but you probably could fine tune a model as well. So like I say, AMD's catching up quick on the software. You might want to subscribe to their Rockin' blog and keep an eye on what's going on with AI because uh, it's just, uh, things are moving fast. The Sapphire Nitro Plus AMD Radeon RX 7900 GRE. Overall, I like this card. It's a really interesting situation with the pricing because there's the 7700 XT, which AMD recently reduced the price on a little bit. The 7900 GRE, then the 7900 XT, and then the 7900 XTX with 24 gigs of VRAM. And the price delta versus performance delta gets a little strange. The 7600 XT and the 7600 offer pretty good performance. The 7600 at roughly a 200-ish dollar card, ideally, Okay, and then you move up to a, a 500-ish, 600-ish dollars for the 7900 GRE. Okay, that's sort of where we are, I guess, at this point with pricing. The 7900 GRE Nitro Plus at $600 is a steal in this uh, landscape of GPUs. But $600 for a 16 gigabyte card, I wish things weren't so expensive now. But 
this is a way, way better deal than the 4070 Super or the 4070. So AMD's really killing it. AMD's also facing a lot of pressure from Intel at the low end. The ARC A770 isn't terrible, uh, but Intel has still got a lot of work to put into their drivers. If anything, Intel has shown just how far AMD has come with their drivers in comparison with NVIDIA. And NVIDIA, because they're moving fast and breaking things in AI and everywhere else, uh, I don't think that their driver stability and awesomeness is uh, living up to the sterling reputation that they earned in uh, years gone by, let's say. Meanwhile, AMD is, of course, restructuring and redoing and growing their software team by leaps and bounds. RDNA and CDNA and the cross-pollination of everything that's going on there. And uh, the dividends yielded from that restructuring are starting to show with new technologies like HyperRx and the stuff that AMD is building into their GPUs. GPU Open and all of the projects there and FSR3, um, they really are good for gamers and game developers. And so it's nice to see more industry traction and more industry adoption. It's uh, a lot of kudos are owed to the AMD driver team, but the best I think is still yet to come. Well, that's been a quick look at the Nitro Plus from Sapphire Gaming OC 16 gigabyte edition. I'm Wendell, this is level one, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.